see uh, what presentation I have more pleasant. So enjoy your eating. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for attending again. It's wonderful to have you with us, uh, really, in this event celebrating the Constitution. Uh, there are great things happening at the center, and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to get uh, my uh, PowerPoint to work or not because I don't see anything here to, to do that. So I, I will just tell you a little bit about what is happening at, oh, then what do I do, push the button? Other button. This way. Oh, okay. Great. You, you just were, uh, that's a first experience for me. This is my first PowerPoint. So uh, thank you all for, for uh, enjoying this with me. I, uh, my students know me as old school. I, I, we, uh, in the center, we assist it. I guess I should begin by saying our mission is to increase constitutional literacy. I see nothing more important for my grandchildren, and that's largely who I live for today, than the need for, for increased constitutional literacy. And we do it at the K through 12 and at the undergraduate level. There's much that's being done, as uh, our guest was saying, at every law school in the country, you take constitutional law. Uh, what you get out of it may be something else again, but you do take it. And uh, so that's our purpose, and we assist in uh, increasing constitutional literacy by teaching 1,500 to 2,000 UVU students each year in the constitutional area, including uh, our unique constitutional studies minor. And I'm looking for Professor Griffin. Oh, okay, that's Professor Griffin. And he directs a very special program, our constitutional studies minor, and there are students around him uh, and, uh, who are minoring in constitutional studies. It is a unique program made all the better by the fact that Professor Griffin uh, directs it. Thank you for all coming. We also have, uh, I call them wood fellows, I think in the gift they were called assistants. And uh, they support the center in our programming with Oxford and assisting with conferences and speakers. I want to uh, expressly uh, thank them. They have picked up the speakers. They, they do everything associated with the conference. They run it. And therefore, they leave able to run things. Uh, we continue, again, to build our relationship with Oxford as partners in developing and marketing the Quill program, and we also continue to provide opportunities during the summer at Oxford for our students. Our wood assistants have gone in the past. We uh, work with uh, and will continue to work with K-12 through schools, including charter schools, to develop curriculum and materials that can be used in increasing constitutional literacy at the K-12 through level. We host conferences like this one, which are streamed on campus and via YouTube. Now we make sure, it, it, one of the nice things is we're not gonna have this lecture, is not gonna be on YouTube. Uh, this is one that, we're, that uh, you're going to get to see firsthand, although it is streamed to a whole group of students over in another room. This is fall 2007, free 17, free markets in the Constitution, spring 2018, religious liberty, 25 years after the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And uh, I was talking, and uh, we hope in February with funding to do a Second Amendment conference. We host lectures, including October 16th through 18th. We are going to have the Honorable Tazdik Hussein Jelani, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, who will speak about world justice through, rule, through the rule of law and written constitutions. Just a wonderful uh, representative. Uh, and that's what we have on that, on that list. Uh, I just want to say personally, I couldn't be 
more gratified or more grateful than to have the opportunity to serve in the capacity I do. It is, in my concluding years in higher education, my gift to my children and grandchildren. And I consider all my students to be my children, too. So I, we have a big family. Uh, we, uh, I, I want to mention that everyone had the opportunity. When you sat down, there is a book. That book is a gift to you. I think reading Professor Barnett's latest book uh, will be both insightful and delightful. It is exceedingly well written, and the substance, as you will see, speaks for itself. Uh, and uh, it, we even have some moments afterwards where, when you can get Professor Barnett to sign your copy. Uh, we uh, are impressed with all the everyone who's participating today. The morning panels, uh, present company excluded, were just magnificent. They couldn't have set a better tone for uh, this luncheon address and the conference after or, and the uh, panel afterwards. Uh, we. Uh, We're deeply grateful for the leadership of uh, this uh, university. President Holland is a wonderful, innovative leader. I've been in higher education for now a generation, and he's one of the three most innovative, capable presidents uh, I've known, and I've known many. And then I want to, the person I report directly to is our Executive Vice President for Academics, Jeff Olson. Jeff, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, he, uh, he shares this real interest in the work of the center. And now it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. I also have a gift for, for him. This is my personal gift to you Randy, uh, I said earlier, and I am going to reiterate, I could go through all of his academic accomplishments, and they are many, but you can find that in uh, the program and other materials. I personally, Randy was my first choice to come as we celebrate the Constitution, and we were doing free markets and the Constitution is what we're focusing on. I know of no one, and I've known him and his work for almost that whole generation, who's made more of a difference and who continues to make the difference he does uh, in the academic world for promoting liberty and the Constitution. Uh, in many, sometimes it seemed as if he was almost alone in his voice in behalf of liberty. So what I have for you, uh, Randy, is a, uh, uni these are United States, uh, the 1987, they're from 1987, you have the, this is a uh, silver dollar and a gold five dollar. And we could have given you a trophy or something, but we just moved and threw a lot of those away. And I th if you throw this away, send it back. <laughs> or put it up on eBay. You can, make, you, you, you can have a vacation based on it or do something. But Randy, this is uh, a gift for you that's a small token of my personal gratitude for all the good that you've done for my grandchildren. And with that, <laughs> Professor Barnett. This is gold. You hold on to that one. So I don't lose it. Wow. I, I I don't know what to say. It's gonna. It's hard to speak in this room. For, I mean, that was the la That was a, an amazing uh, uh, introduction, and then to have that sort of a, a gift, um, uh, and yet to look out at this uh, tableau uh, in front of me, I'm just so grateful that you guys are all facing this way. 
Because um, if you were facing that way, and I was over standing over there, you wouldn't hear a word I said, because you'd just have to be watching this. Anyway, thanks so much um, uh, for uh, Rod for those very, very kind remarks. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. Thank you, President Holland, for um, taking time out of your what I know is going to be is your very, very busy schedule to be here and attend uh, this talk. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here and speak today. Uh, it's always a good, good opportunity to visit Utah, uh, which is such a, an amazing state. Um, and I'm also very grateful to the Center for providing you with copies of my book, Our Republican Constitution, which you found on your seat. Now you have to put it someplace else while you eat. Uh, you'll notice that if you looked at, the, at the, um, the book blurbs on the back, your senator, Mike Lee, is one of the book blurb uh, endorsers. Uh, Mike and I, um, I endorsed his book and he endorsed my book. That's what we, what we authors about the Constitution do for each other. Uh, he's, he's, a, uh, he's, just an unbel he's just a wonderful human being. I want to get this out of the way. A wonderful human being and uh, I'm, great, I'm, I'm privileged to, uh, to call him my friend. Uh, the thesis of my book, Our Republican Constitution, is uh, that there are two fundamentally different conceptions of the Constitution. The one I call the democratic conception of the Constitution is based on the idea of we the people as a group. We the people as a group. The, what I call the Republican Constitution is based on a conception of we the people as individuals sovereign as a group, then the sovereign people ought to be able to rule, and, and rule by we the people means essentially rule according to the will of the people, and the will of the people can really only be the same as the will of a majority of the people. It can't be the will of each and every person, so it's the will of the majority of the people. So a conception of the Constitution based on we the people, um, based on the will of we the people as a group, would lead to a democratic constitution which would say the purpose of a constitution is to somehow express the will of the majority um, uh, in our laws. And that would lead to a democratic constitution. And that is, I think, very commonly held. It's so commonly held that as I identify it, you may be wondering what other conception of the constitution there even could be. And it is what I call the Republican constitution. And the Republican constitution is based on the conception of we the people as individuals, each and every one of us. And it was identified in the Declaration of Independence, which says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and are the life, uh, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, each one of which of these rights were individual rights, rights the individual has. And then the very next sentence of the Declaration says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. To secure these rights, those two sentences identify both the end of government and the purpose of government, which is to secure the pre-existing natural rights of we the people. That was stated in our founding document, the document that created us as a people. The Constitution did not create us as a people. We didn't get a Constitution until some 13 years later. Uh, our Constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation. And the book is about the different implications of those two conceptions for uh, the proper role of judges in our society. Because if you have a view, a democratic view of the Constitution, then the role of judges is problematic because judges are not representative of the will of the people. They don't represent a majority. They're not elected. They're not accountable. And they shouldn't, it is thought, get in the way of the will of the majority of the people. And if they do, that is problematic. That is one conception of judges. It's a conception of judges that was promoted by the progressives and it's a conception of judges that's held by many, many political conservatives today. The other vision of the Constitution yields a different conception of justice. The Republican vision of the Constitution yields a conception of what judges should be doing, and that is the judges too are agents and servants of we the people, and they have a constitutional duty to protect the rights of the people from even the will of the majority. If you have that view of, a, of, of we the people and of a Constitution, you're going to have a different role of judges. That means uh, judges should be interpreting and following the Constitution uh, rather than making up their own Constitution to something that they think is better. They, should, they have a duty to enforce the higher law over the lower law of the statute. The Consti this is what Alexander Hamilton said in Federalist 78, that the Constitution constitutes a higher law, and judges have a duty to follow that when it's in conflict with a lower law, which would be a statute. That means that judges should follow the Constitution. And it also means, as I will explain in the bulk of my talk, 
that the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed. And judges are not the ones who are able to change it, nor can the other branches of government change it without going through the amendment process. But how are we doing on picking judges who, are, who profess to adhere to the original meaning of the Constitution? We have not been doing so well. We have not been doing so well. On the other hand, we just did pretty well. We just got a justice appointed to the Supreme Court who was an expressed originalist. Um, and, as I'm going to explain in my talk, that's the first time that's happened in 30 years. The last time a justice was nominated to the court who wasn't expressed originalist, at the time he was nominated, was Judge Robert Bork from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, um, who was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1987, 30 years ago, and was defeated. So my talk today is about what happened between 1987 and 2017 to change the result. Not only to change the result, but as important, to change the tenor of the debate. So let me just get on with my talk as you please enjoy your lunch. 30 years ago on June 26, 1987, Justice Lewis Powell resigned his seat on the Supreme Court. And four days later, on July 1st, President Ronald Reagan nominated former Yale Law Professor and DC Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Robert Bork to take his place. Within 45 minutes of that nomination, Massachusetts Democrat Senator Ted Kennedy took to the floor of the Senate with a strong condemnation of Bork. Just to refresh the recollections of those of you who were alive and the great majority of you who were not alive, here is uh, just a snippet of what uh, uh, Senator Kennedy had to say. Down. We tested everything beforehand beside these other than the sound. At least you all have something to eat while we're waiting. <laughs> You're not going to die of hunger, that's for sure. I could actually read you the text of this one, but the next video is the one I really want you to hear. So, uh, and I can't read it to you, so I'm gonna wait patiently for the sound to be restored. I wish I could do a Ted Kennedy uh, accent. I wish I could do a Kennedy accent and imitate it. All right, I, th I think we should just proceed with the talk.
I showed this video the first time, but I realized it was put up by Town Hall because that was Justice Sotomayor, who was then an aide to Senator Kennedy, who was in the lower right-hand corner of that video, sitting there in the, in the uh, before she was Justice Sotomayor, of course. All right, so that was, that was uh, Ted Kennedy. Um, it was not until mid-September, some four months later, that the Senate Judiciary Committee convened 12 days of hearings, which were spread over more than two weeks. While those hearings were in session, People for the American Way, a group founded and funded by progressive Hollywood TV producer Norman Lear, aired paid TV commercials narrated by Gregory Peck, who I will inform some of you was an extremely famous actor at the time, um, which attacked Bork as an extremist. why I wanted you to see that. Much of the Democrats' focus during the hearings was on Bork's commitment to originalism, and in particular, the results they said would, resu that the, the results they said would happen uh, from employing a consistently originalist methodology. And it was on the basis of these alleged results that many both inside and outside the Senate would claim that Bork would turn back the clock on civil rights. On October 23, 1987, some four months after he was nominated, Robert Bork's nomination was rejected by a Democrat-led Senate by a vote of 58 to 42. Tellingly, while two Democrats voted for his confirmation, six Republicans joined the Democrats to vote against him. With Bork's rejection, Justice Powell's seat would eventually be filled by Justice Anthony Kennedy, and the verb to be Borked had entered into the political lexicon. If you want a particular moment in time when the politicization of the judicial nomination process began, this was it. Never before had a judicial nomination confronted an organized publicity campaign outside the courtroom complete with television ads. Now, some 30 years later, on January 31st, 2017, President Donald Trump nominated Judge Neil Gorsuch to assume the seat vacated by the death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Hearings on his nomination, held just two months later in March, occupied just four days. On April 7th, a little over two months since his nomination, Justice Gorsuch was confirmed by a vote of 54 to 45 with two Democrats joining all 52 Republicans. This was truly remarkable. In the wake of the failed Bork nomination, each of the persons Republican presidents had nominated to be justices, Anthony Kennedy, David Souter, John Roberts, and Sam Alito, had abstained from identifying themselves as originalists. And even that originalist stalwart, Clarence Thomas, did not self-identify as an originalist at the time of his nomination. Unlike all these men, 
Neil Gorsuch had expressly endorsed originalism as the proper method of constitutional interpretation. Indeed, he had been chosen in part because he had publicly endorsed originalism. So as they had with Bork, Senate Democrats again sought to make an issue of this commitment. And because Judge Gorsuch stuck to his guns in defense of his originalism, the issue was joined. Yet this time, not only was the result different, so too was the popular discourse. Although many of you were not alive when the prog uh, to, to follow the progress of the Bork nomination and to witness his defeat, I am sure most of you followed the progress of the Gorsuch nomination and in the press. And perhaps you even watched parts of the hearings. So you are all witnesses to the fact that despite the sometimes harsh questioning by Senate Democrats, there was no public outcry about Gorsuch's originalism. We heard no litany of the civil rights that would be rolled back were he to be confirmed. The only thing you probably remember hearing about, if you remember anything at all from the hearing, was about a single frozen truck driver. Sorry to remind you of that, but that was the only thing that sort of made any, any sort of news. That Gorsuch would be more likely to be confirmed by a Republican Senate majority surely diminished the incentives of activist groups. Um, oh, I sorry, sorry, I just skipped ahead here. What happened over the past 30 years that accounts for this difference in both the tenor and the outcome of the debate? In this talk, I want to provide my answer to this question. But before I do, I want to acknowledge one difference that was, in fact, crucial. In 1987, the Senate was controlled by the Democrats. In 2017, it was controlled by the Republicans. That meant that Bork needed Democrat support to be confirmed, but Gorsuch did not. That Gorsuch would be more likely to be confirmed by a Republican Senate majority surely diminished the incentives of activist groups to organize against him. And the fact that supporters of the nominee controlled the Senate Judiciary Committee surely affected its tenor. It also made for a much speedier hearing and a final vote by the Senate. On the other hand, to confirm Justice Gorsuch with a majority of 52 votes, Senate Republicans had to use what was called the nuclear option to end the filibuster of all Supreme Court nominees as Harry Reid and the Democrats had ended it with lower court judges and executive branch appointments. And I can tell you from personal knowledge that this was not a popular move amongst Senate Republicans, Repu amongst Republican senators who thought that ending, they didn't, not only did they like the filibuster, but they didn't like ending it by the nuclear option, which is an end run around the Senate rules. So this was not a popular move amongst Republicans. And because of that, had Senate Democrats and their activist supporters been able to demonize Gorsuch the way they had demonized Bork, it is unlikely that the Republican caucus would have stuck together to make the rules change. Without that momentous change in the rules, Gorsuch's simple majority support among Republicans would not have been enough for confirmation, and we would have had the typical Washington kabuki in which there would have been a vote on the motion for closure. All the Republicans would have vote, voted to close debate. That would have failed, and then the nomination would have failed, and the Republicans could have said, well, we did what we could. But that's not what happened. They did change the rules, and I believe they changed the rules because Gorsuch emerged from the hearings unscathed. Moreover, recall that 30 years ago, six Republican senators voted against Robert Bork's nomination, whereas none voted against Neil Gorsuch in 2017. In large part, this is due to the fact that some of the criticisms aimed at Bork got traction, especially those surrounding him being an originalist, while the critics who questioned Justice Gorsuch about his originalism repeatedly spun their wheels. Why? Why did that happen? I believe at least part of the difference was a result of what I'm calling for this talk the mainstreaming of originalism. So it's worth considering how and why that happened. For the explanation reveals the limits of how, of what senators and activists can do on the ground without the air cover provided by academics, and in this case, by law professors. In the 30 years between Gorsuch and Bork, between Bork and Gorsuch, while Republican presidents were nominating non-originalist Republican justices like Kennedy, Souter, Roberts, and Alito, a small handful of legal academics, and I mean a very small handful, were developing the theory of originalism. 
And with the elevation of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, their efforts have now borne fruit. So first, let me begin by defining what I mean by originalism. I mentioned it a little bit in my intro. Originalism is the view, and sit tight, you know, don't eat anything at the time I'm reading this because it's a very shocking proposition. <laughs> Originalism is the view that the meaning of the written constitution was fixed at the time it was enacted and that this fixed meaning should constrain constitutional actors, including judges and legislators today. Let me say that again because I, I don't want to go too fast for you. Originalism is the view first that the meaning of the written constitution is fixed at the time it's enacted. And second, that this fixed meaning should constrain constitutional actors, including judges and legislators today. That's originalism. To appreciate why this is so, it's good to start with the proposition that the Constitution is not the law that governs us. What is the Constitution? There's a copy of the Constitution. What is this? This is not the law that governs us. This is the law that governs those who govern us. This is not the law that governs us. They make laws to govern us. This is the law to govern those who govern us. And those who are to be governed by this Constitution can no more change the law that governs them without going through the amendment process described in Article 5 than we, the people, can change the speed limits that govern us without going through the legislative process by which speed limits are set. Just as we, the people, cannot update speed limits to the ones that we think are more suitable, or adopt what we might call living speed limits without going through the legislative process, neither can those who govern us properly update this Constitution without amending its text. With this in mind, originalism can be summarized in just a single sentence, which I said to you at the beginning. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. So that's originalism. So the first point I want to make is that in 1987, none of what I just said to you was articulated or widely known. This is because in 1987, there was little or no theory of originalism. Indeed, you may be surprised to learn that the label originalist itself was actually coined in 1980, just seven years before Bork was nominated, by a Stanford law professor named Paul Brest in a law review article in which he criticized the writings of conservative writers such as Robert Bork and Raoul Berger, he, and, and so he coined the term originalist. Because Bork and Berger and others lacked any theoretical understanding of their own approach, it may be better to call them proto-originalists. What, what, Bre what Brest actually did is he, because there was no theory of originalism to criticize, he coined the term originalism, then he formulated what that theory must be, and then he criticized it. And his, his article was quite sophisticated. I had to read it re-read re re it recently to, to prepare these, this speech, and it's actually very impressive. He did a pretty good job formulating a theory of originalists because folks like Raoul Berger and Robert Bork in those days had no theory of originalism. Brest had to make one up for him before he, um, before he criticized him. So given that they didn't have a theory, it's really, in some sense, better to call them pre-originalists or proto-originalists. And their proto-originalism was different than the originalism of today. First and foremost, proto-originalists uniformly invoked the intentions of the Constitution's drafters or framers to decide what was constitutional today. So if, for example, the framers of the First Amendment did not intend, expect, or foresee its free speech protections applying to flag burning in 1791 when the amendment was ratified, then the First Amendment today should not be construed as so applying. Or if the framers of the 14th Amendment did not intend, expect, or foresee it, ex uh, it applying to segregated schools or to discrimination against women in 1868 when that amendment was ratified, then the 14th Amendment today should not be so construed. At his hearing, the central issue of Bork's originalism was framed by former Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Shirley Hofstadler like this. And yes, a, a, a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge testified against Bork at his hearings. And here's what she said. To limit the search for meaning to the thoughts of colonial gentlemen as applied to the conditions of the 17th and 18th centuries, 
would destroy the hopes of its draftsmen to write a charter of government for their posterity, and I might add for our own. It is as futile to discern the meaning of these words from a crabbed originalist point of view as it would be to know the meaning of marriage solely from the words of the nuptial vows and the thoughts of the bride and groom on their wedding day. Notice the emphasis on their thoughts. Or, as Senator Kennedy put it in a question to the University of Chicago law professor Philip Perlin, someone else who testified against Bork, given what he has said as an originalist thinker, asked the senator, and given his statements here about the limitations of the Constitution in enhancing or even defining the kind of rights and liberties that are being protected, would this be an area that would be of very considerable concern to you, should he be approved? That there may be a significant threat to the rights and liberties of American citizens? To this, Professor Perlin answered, yes, it would be of concern to him. But in response to powerful criticisms leveled against originalism by law professors like Paul Brest and others, over the past 30 years, originalism has markedly changed from this proto-originalism of original framers' intentions and expectations to something else. Starting back in the 1980s, then Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Antonin Scalia urged lawyers in the Reagan Justice Department working under Attorney General Ed Meese to stop talking about the intentions of the framers and start talking instead about the meaning the words of the text would have had to the general public. In other words, to stop seeking framers' intent and start seeking the original public meaning of the text. But this was a call heard largely within the walls of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Meese Justice Department. It was something, for example, not being in the Meese Justice Department, I knew nothing about, even though I was a young law professor at the time. In the 1990s, after the failure of the Bork nomination, this call would move into the academic realm, most notably in the writings of Northwestern University law professor Gary Lawson, who is now on the law faculty of Boston University. The move from Framer's intent to pr original public meaning was huge. It meant that we today are bound not by the prejudices of those who wrote and enacted the Constitution and its amendments, but by the public meaning of the words they wrote and ratified. Now the second big move was made in the 1990s, not by a law professor, but by a young political science professor at Princeton named Keith Whittington. It was Whittington who first noticed that when we focus only on the words of the Constitution, we find that the information conveyed by these words may not be enough to resolve constitutional controversies. This is the law that governs those who govern us. It has content, but it may not have enough content to resolve all issues that we have to decide upon either in Congress or in the courts. And when that happens, we unavoidably move from what he called constitutional interpretation, which is ascertaining the meaning of the words, to what he called constitutional construction, which is putting that meaning into effect. Again, by interpretation, we mean the, the, the activity of identifying the communicative content of the text, and by construction, we mean the distinct activity of putting that content into effect, giving it legal effect in particular cases and controversies. While the application of some constitutional provisions is straightforward, the president must be 35 years of age, Congress consists of a House and a Senate, and each state gets two senators, the provisions we argue most about were written in a general way and are not always so obvious to apply. What exactly is speech protected by the First Amendment? And as important, what constitutes an abridgment of the right of freedom of speech? What exactly is a search that is governed by the Fourth Amendment? And as important, what constitutes an unreasonable search and seizure? While possible answers to these questions may be narrowed down by historical examination of the original public meaning of these terms, it may still leave open a range of options for present day constitutional actors, be they congressional legislators, the president, or federal judges. These two theoretical developments, the move from framers' intentions to original public meaning, and the recognition of the difference between identifying original meaning and applying it to cases, left a lot of room for originalist results that better comported with contemporary sensibilities. In 1999, I delivered a lecture at Loyola Law School in New Orleans that was entitled, An Originalism for Non-Originalists, in which I contended there was much in originalism that progressives 
could and should embrace. Indeed, when Robert Bork was nominated in 1987, I myself was not an originalist, pri primarily because I did not see why we should be bound by the intentions of the framers. I dismissed this as looking at the framers as our wardens, as our, or our masters, requiring us to do what I call channel the framers, and which approached constitutional controversies by asking questions such as, oh framers, would you think that the thermal imaging of a home to detect the increased heat caused by marijuana cultivation was a search? <laughs> this is not a historical question. There is no historical answer to that question. It's a counterfactual question. And then I accept it as valid, the critiques leveled at proto-originalists by Paul Brest and others, that seeking a collective intention of the framers definite enough to resolve present cases and controversies, like, for example, whether thermal imaging constitutes a search, was simply impractical. It just couldn't really be done. When I became a law professor in 1982, I taught contracts, not constitutional law. By 1999, I'd come to see that seeking the original public meaning of the text was akin to seeking the objective meaning of a written contract, and that Whittington's distinction between interpretation and construction, which is also a feature of classical contract law, revealed that originalism itself allowed for room for flexibility in applying the original meaning of the text to particular cases and controversies today. So by 1999, I had become an originalist. And since then, I've added my voice to the small but growing chorus of originalist law professors who developed what came to be called the new originalism, based on the original public meaning of the text. In this, I was soon joined by my Georgetown colleague, Professor Larry Solom, who enriched originalism still further with his sophisticated understanding of the insights drawn from the philosophy of language. And it was this approach, the original public meaning approach, that had been endorsed by then judge and now justice Neil Gorsuch. Not the framers' intentions approach of proto-originalists like Robert Bork. So perhaps the biggest difference between 1987 and 2017 was that originalism itself had changed from a theory that was vulnerable to both caricature, like we saw there, and accurate criticisms to a position that was both more modest in its claims and easier to defend. Second, due to the research efforts of law professors, our understanding of the original meaning of the text has greatly developed over the past three decades. We simply hadn't been doing very much originalist research, so we didn't know that much about what the meanings of the different provisions were. Consider one example that featured prominently at the Bork hearings. At the hearing, Bork was asked by Senators Biden and DeConcini about the meaning of the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment, as you all know, I'm just saying that facetiously, uh, is, says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. I think that's like the most important sense in the Constitution, but the Supreme Court has disagreed with me. To this question, what do you think the Ninth Amendment means, Bork re uh, replied as follows, quote, I do not think you can use the Ninth Amendment unless you know something of what it means. For example, if you had an amendment that said, Congress shall make no, and then there is an ink blot, and you cannot read the rest of it, and that's the only copy you have, I do not think the court can make up what might be under the ink blot. This was so unsatisfactory an answer that even the Wall Street Journal editorial page editorialized against that answer, the ink blot answer to what the Ninth Amendment means. And it's somewhat embarrassing for somebody who believes himself, who pr professes to be a textualist to deny that a whole amendment to the Constitution has any discoverable meaning. Stanford law professor and historian Tom Gray replied to this in his testimony at the Bork hearings this way. Robert Bork's interpretive philosophy illustrates one of the founders' fears, an interpreter who would, in defiance of the Ninth Amendment, anachronistically betray the central premise of our constitutionalism, the protection on fair terms of all our rights we need, as a people, to recapture our constitutional heritage of rights under the rule of law, and I submit to demand of ourselves, and certainly of our judges, understanding of and respect for this great, this beloved tradition. So you see how what this left-of-center law professor did. He got to Robert Bork's right when he came to originalism in his, in his testimony. So one of the problems with Bork was that his own deficiencies as an originalist scholar made his commitment to originalism less easy to defend. 
Since 1987, however, much excellent research has been done on the original meanings of many provisions of the Constitution, including the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment. Indeed, it was the sustained study of the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment that became the focus of my own scholarship and that led me from con contracts to constitutional law and then to be an originalist. In my view, the available evidence shows that the original meaning of the rights retained by the people was a reference to natural liberty rights. I should stress that this conclusion does not entail that judges may invalidate legislation as unconstitutional because it violates the judge's conception of natural rights. But it does mean that the enumeration in the Constitution of such rights as freedom of speech and freedom of the press does not make those rights privileged over other liberties that are protected by the text of the Constitution in other ways and by other amendments. So 30 years after the nomination and rejection of Robert Bork to be Justice of the Supreme Court, much has changed. First and foremost, the theory and practice of originalism has been greatly developed and refined and, and is far more defensible than it once was. Secondly, much research on the original meanings of provisions like the Ninth Amendment has been conducted. And as a result, the intellectual terrain has shifted greatly from 1987 to 2017. This difference was manifested in Justice Gorsuch's response to a question from Senator Ben Sass on the meaning of the Ninth Amendment. In contrast with Judge Bork's reference to it as an impenetrable inkblot, um, Justice Gorsuch replied, well, Senator, this is Gorsuch's, just, Justice Gorsuch's reply, well, Senator, I think it means what it says, which perhaps coincidentally is the title of my 2006 Texas Law Review article on the original meaning of the ninth, of, 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 called the, the Ninth Amendment, it means what it says. Then, it probably is a coincidence, by the way, because in fact, it's kind of natural to say, well, the Ninth Amendment means what it says. Um, but he might have read my article in prepping for this testimony. <laughs> then, when be asked by Senator Sass about Robert Bork's reference to as an inkblot, remember now, Senator Sass is, Sass is a relatively young man, but he asked, Justice Gorsuch about what Robert Bork had said about the inkblot. That's how famous it was. And here, and, and, he, and Senator Sad said, seemingly implying that it can just be ignored, Justice Gorsuch merely referenced the fact that the courts had not much interpreted it and let it go at that. He sort of punted. No senator pursued the matter further, ending the discussion with a whimper rather than with a bang. So perhaps this difference between then, and, but perhaps this difference between then and now was most dramatically revealed by who testified at the hearings for Bork and Gorsuch. At the Bork hearings, the list of prominent law professors testifying against his confirmation was a veritable who's who of big time law professors, including, and this is just to hit the highlights, Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe, Duke law professor Walter Dellinger, who was reputed to have advised Judiciary Committee Chairman um, Joe Biden on how to question Bork, Biden not exactly a legal scholar himself, uh, Bork's Yale Law School colleagues Owen Fist and Paul Gewertz, David A.J. Richards of the NYU School of Law, Stanford Law Professor Tom Gray, then USC Law Professor Judith Resnick, who is now on the faculty of the Yale Law School, University of Chicago Law Professor Philip Perlin, then Harvard Law Professor Kathleen Sullivan, who went on to be Dean of the Stanford Law School, and then Dean of the Northwestern Law School, Robert Bennett. And that's just the highlights. The list is longer. In contrast with the who's who of law professors testifying against the confirmation of Robert Bork, just a single, relatively obscure law professor testified against Judge, Judge Gorsuch's confirmation. And I won't say who it was. He's a perfectly nice man. There's no reason to characterize him publicly as obscure. Um, but he, if I told you who he was, you would not recognize the name. That's, that's the point. He's obscure. Uh, and one, my colleague, Larry Solem, expressly defended originalism to the committee. That's it. With one exception, no prominent law professor criticized Gorsuch for his originalism in the media or in the blogosphere. The one exception was Professor Erwin Chemerinsky, now dean of the Bolt Hall School of Law, that the, the law school at Berkeley, who wrote an op-ed in which he offered an internally contradictory critique of originalism that it was both, on the one hand, impossible to identify a singular original meaning of the text, and at the same time, and in the next sentence, that all originalist results are horrific. These two, by the way, just don't go together. You can't both not know what it means, but all the meanings are bad. It just those two things don't work. But those were in succeeding sentences in his op-ed. The only others to criticize Gorsuch publicly for his originalism were marginal, 
or retired law professors who trotted out the same old playbook that had been used against the proto-originalism of Robert Bork, rather than the originalism of today. These criticisms were easily parried. It is an undeniable fact that the most knowledgeable progressive law professors remained on the sidelines during the Gorsuch nomination process. And I can only speculate about why they did not join the fray this time around, when they were front and center against Robert Bork. Perhaps they believed that Judge Gorsuch's nomination was assured, and they did not want to get on, the, get on the wrong side of a sitting justice. You cannot underestimate that as a motivator for law professors. But I think another reason was their, uh, for their reticence was because originalism as an approach to constitutional interpretation has been mainstreamed due to the efforts of a small handful of legal academics who comprise the existing infrastructure of originalist theory and practice. Prominent law professors who have been keeping up with events since Robert Bork's nomination know that originalism itself has changed to a much more defensible position, and perhaps for this reason they did not feel comfortable taking it on in public. If I'm right about this, and here is the lesson, then who gets to be on law school faculties matters a great deal to the direction of the courts. It is not enough for those who favor adhering to the original meaning of the Constitution to elect a Republican president and a Republican Senate. The intellectual infrastructure of originalist theory and practice must exist outside the courts and outside the political arena. To claim that originalism has been mainstream is not to claim that all law professors are originalists. To the contrary, the overwhelming majority of those who teach constitutional law are not originalists and even disparage it to their students in class, although they basically disparage the old originalism. They don't usually tell the students about the new originalism. But it is to claim that the new and improved originalism is no longer to be safely dismissed by those with the gravitas to weigh in on judicial nominations, such as, um, um, as outside the mainstream of legal thought. As Justice Elena Kagan, the former dean of Harvard Law School, expressed during her confirmation hearings, at least with respect to the more concrete provisions of the Constitution, she said, we are all originalists now. And this mainstreaming of originalism is, to paraphrase Joe Biden's comment on the enactment of Obamacare, a big friggin' deal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, <coughs> Randy, and it did. Uh, he has highlighted a momentous shift in the way we look at the Constitution. And uh, I was uh, given the opportunity to uh, testify in behalf of Clarence Thomas before the Judiciary Committee. And I emphasized looking at theories of precedent, theories of interpretation, he had been attacked for something that, if anything, captures the spirit of the document. Uh, he was attacked for uh, his belief in natural rights. And so they kept much of that quiet. Well, this has been a significant uh, shift. And there, there are progressives that now rightfully uh, take into consideration the theory of uh, originalism, original meaning. Uh, and all this bodes well, but it can also demonstrate how quickly matters can change, and so we need to be vigilant, and uh, like Randy, I remember well those days in legal education when, when there were few of us. Uh, but voices crying in the wilderness sometimes change the very nature of how things proceed. I want to express collectively again our appreciation, not just for Professor Barnett's work or words, but for his tireless work in behalf of a constitution he holds dear. Thank you, Randy.
uh, I also want to thank the chef and the, uh, the students uh, who, from the UVU Dining Services. We have